there is a cool, 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 cool fan film that is currently trending on YouTube. It was up to like number five. I'm not sure what it is now, but it is seriously trending. It is called um, Vader Episode One, Shards of the Past. This is a Star Wars fan film. And I have a link to it not below because if I have, there's so many links for this episode that I can't put them on the page. Otherwise, I'll get a community guidelines strike. But you can go to my website at wrstone.com and click the uh, one on the sidebar. Sorry, over here. Sidebar where it says um, li the uh, charity live stream. And at the bottom of that, you're going to see all of the links for this episode, the stuff I talk about. There is quite a lot of them. In terms of this fan film, Vader Episode 1, this is a really, really good fan film. I would class it certainly better as the current sequel trilogy, and particularly The Last Jedi, which I make no bones about thinking is a piece of crap on many levels. But your mileage may vary. I know some people who like it, and that's fine. Nobody has to get into name-calling over it. I just like this movie, and I, other people don't. I just like it. Other people like it. That's life. It's cool. But if you were ever going to ask the question, and it's been in the back of my mind from time to time for many years, why, during that period between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, why did Vader not try to kill the Emperor and takes, take over? This is the first part of a beginning of an answer to that question. So setting the stage, uh, Captain Jesse says, the new Vader fan film, camera angle, seemed too tight for me liking C. Um, that's part of what I'm going to talk about, some of the, uh, some of the aspects of the um, direction and cinematography and stuff and how that kind of all worked together. Um, the tightness of the camera angle you're seeing there. Um, well, let me, get, let me get through the setting the stage on this. Um, it isn't a spoiler. It isn't a spoiler to tell you what the opening card on this is. It's not a scroll. It's a card like you saw in uh, Solo, but it still works. What the card says is, Anakin Skywalker is dead. For eight months, the mysterious Darth Vader has enforced the Emperor's commands. Fighting between the loss of Padme and the new cursed life he must now lead, Vader must do what must be done. When a surviving Jedi Master from Order 66 is lured, has lured him to the home planet of his late wife's tomb. So that's the opening part of it. I won't spoil it any more than that. I can say that from a story standpoint, this is really good. Again, if you're ever asked the question, why didn't Vader try to kill the Emperor and take over? This is the first episode in what would be an answer to that question. It is a 16-minute minisode, three of which those minutes are end titles. But if I was making this thing, I'd want some kind of, um, you know, credit as well. That would be fun. It is the first of what would probably be a three-part story. And uh, they're now getting, as I say, a ton of attention on YouTube and elsewhere, and I think it's deservedly so. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if they got the funding they need for the next two episodes. It is well acted, and the production design, and this is where we got to get off into that thing about the camera angle being tight. The, the production design I found fairly ingenious. They had a relatively small soundstage space to work on for what probably should have been a much larger space than what we saw. You know, when we've seen Emperor's Throne Rooms and things like that, they've been huge and, you know, fairly large and ornate even. Um, so these, this space probably should have been much larger. And so that's when you get into things like the direction, the cinematography, and the uh, camera angle uh, being tight. Uh, they didn't have a lot of space to move around. And so they simply had to do what they could do. Uh, for me, while yes, I think it's maybe a little too tight from time to time, I thought that between the direction, the cinematography, and the special effects, it, it was showing us things in this small space that, you know, at least I was not immediately conscious of how small the space was. And that's a question of, you know, direction and cinematography. Uh, making it so that the small space didn't seem as small as it did. 
Um, but they certainly had to do, as you mentioned, uh, Captain Jesse, they certainly had to do a lot more closer shots. Um, if you were doing that, you know, in a very large space, uh, then you could do things, you know, with more distance shots and stuff like that. Conceivably, they could have done more with blue screens on that, but to be honest, uh, unless you've got some really good professional equipment, blue screens tend to look like this, where you can see the lines around my hand, you know, when you see the blue screen. So, a green screen, rather. So, I, I you know... I forgive them that to some extent because, again, they were working in a small, limited space. And so, you know, uh, I didn't think that was bad. Would it have been nicer if they'd been able to pull out some? Yes. But they didn't have the space to pull out. So, um, this is one of those things, again, uh, they are showing us force powers that are logical. We have now seen some of them, but they could, if you retcon, it could certainly easily have appeared in any canonical Star Wars. This uh, film is a great watch. Vader Episode 1, Shards of the Past. Go watch it. Uh, there is a link to it on my website because I can't put one here without getting a community guidelines strike. But you can go to my website at wrstone.com and uh, sl simply click on the sidebar and there will be a link for this charity and everything will be at the bottom. So after having talked about that, Star Wars, uh, the uh, that particular fan film, I could push to the uh, Paradise Strong Fire Relief GoFundMe again. Uh, again, this is a uh, great charity. They are taking every dime that you spend with them, and it will be spent on the victims. They are not sucking up a bunch of that stuff for the infrastructure or anything else. It's going straight to victims. And if you want to donate to that, then I please wish you would. There is the first link in my description box down below. It's scrolling past on the lower third from time to time. And uh, the URL for it is gofundme.com slash paradise strong, one word, dash fire, dash relief. That's gofundme.com slash paradise strong, dash fire, dash relief. And please give early and give often. Now, uh, you know, there's a number of YouTubers on here who have made a name for themselves bitching about Star Wars. And I bitch too, but not the same way, not as loud, not as vociferously. I like to think that I am the thinking fans fan. But I do have some very definite opinions about Star Wars. And um, what the hell, I'll give it to you, just on the off chance that maybe it'll get me some views. In terms of the state of Star Wars generally, I have now resigned myself that there will never again be another really good Star Wars movie. The last one, the last really good one, was The Empire Strikes Back in 1980. It has now been 39 years, and they have yet to come out with a really good one. And I have finally figured it out. There will no longer be any really good Star Wars movies ever again. It's been 39 years. What can I say? I'm a slow learner sometimes. Now, you might ask me, people have asked, actually, what about Return of the Jedi? Wasn't that a good film? Well, it was a good way to end out that series. If there'd been no more Star Wars movies after that, I'd have been perfectly fine with it. Um, it's better than the prequels, it's better than the current batch, but it isn't great. It's, it's not as good as the first two. Um, so that's kind of where I feel about on that. It's not a bad film. It's better than what we've gotten ever since. But neither is a great film in the way that the original and Empire Strikes Back were. It's been 39 years since there's been a really good Star Wars movie. That's just the way it's going to be. There aren't going to be any others. The uh, last one was 39 years ago. It's, it's totally illogical to imagine that after six, seven, eight, nine more movies that you're going to get one that's any good if you haven't had one for 39 years. What I do remember, though, about watching Return of the Jedi is a little more interesting. 
Now, I first saw this at the Stewart's Theater here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, this is uh, now the Rococo Theater. I have a link for that at my website, www.wrstone.com. Click on the uh, link for the charity live stream on the sidebar. You will see it. Now, I saw this thing, as I said, at the Stewart, now Rococo Theater. I can only ever think of it as the Stewart. Um, it is Lincoln's first real Grand Dame Theater. You're seeing some pictures from it here. It's been recently fairly well um, uh, renovated. Um, doesn't look quite like it did in its heyday, but damn close. It was originally a stage... Uh, sorry, I'm moving my notes around here so I can see them. It was originally a stage film. Um, stage theater, rather, was converted for films with most of the backstage, and you're seeing it here, this backstage area, <laughs> that backstage area, including that big lighting panel, became Barrymore's nightclub in the 1980s, which, unsurprisingly, has been popular with theater students in the area since it opened, certainly popular when I went there. Today, the Rococo is still largely live theater, and it has dinner theater seating. It can be converted very quickly. And this is the building it's in, by the way, the beautiful Stewart Building, the top of which has a very high-end upscale restaurant that I have never been able to eat at. Uh, this is a little bit of a picture that I thought was cool. It's hard to see. The Stewart banner is vertical along there, along one side of that. I'll point it out again as it comes around. And here you're seeing where they've got some dinner things, the, uh, seating set up, and that's from the, one, one of the balconies. Uh, this is the interior of one of their um, uh, of the lobby, you know, very, very well maintained. Basically, and this is a bar that they have. They, they not only do, you know, intermission snacks and stuff, they do have a real bar. Uh, this is the theater, if you were, and had a lot of money and you were uh, renting it for your wedding. You can see that the, uh, it has three balconies. <laughs> that's Barrymore's. That's Barrymore's bar. So it's turned into something that's very interesting. Um, it's also used for live theater. And here you can see, this is from the stage, you can see all of the balconies, all three balconies. This theater seats 1,800 people when it is set up as a theater. You can do private rentals for it, weddings if you have a ton of cash, and occasional movie revivals are seen there. My high school senior class rented it so that we could show the comedy Airplane one night to the graduating senior class. That was our senior gift. 1983. It was totally movie theater. That's when Jedi was released. Now, this one, interesting. You're seeing them on a balcony. This was a box seat. A box seat with the stairs leading up then to, to the first balcony. Uh, this was a movie theater at the time. Uh, doesn't look quite like it does now. Wasn't in quite as well repair, although it had been recently renovated, to be very pristine and very similar to what it had been back when it was the first Grand Dame Theater here in Lincoln. Um, hey, Larry, Larry. Hello, Bill and Chad. Captain Jesse is here tonight. Appreciate you being here for the five-hour charity live stream, raising money for campfire survivors with the Paradise Strong Fire Relief GoFundMe. I've talked about that a bit. Worth going into before I get too deep into what uh, I'm talking about with the Stewart Theater. Um, yes, and hi, Bill. Yep. Uh, the, uh, the GoFundMe I've chosen is one that's pre-existing. It is tax deductible. And you can head it by going to GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, all one word, dash fire, dash relief. And it's the first link in my description box. It is also scrolling past in my lower third. Please give early and give often. Now, as I say, the Stewart Theater, which you're seeing here, and I always get a kick out of that one. That's the bar. That's Barrymore's bar. So is that, by the way. I'm so damned old that I came in on the tail end of that. That's a lighting board. I actually used to use lighting boards like that way back when. So this was a theater, movie theater. It seated 1,800 people. It's a very large one, three balconies. It had been completely renovated uh, to be pristine that last year. She was very much back in her full glory. She has three balconies. The renovation included... Um, the upper two balconies because they'd been closed for a couple of decades, but they needed the seats for Star Wars and other summer blockbuster movies, so they renovated that. thing has an orchestra pit that is still used on occasion. 
and it has a huge glass chandelier over what was a domed ceiling. You will occasionally see pictures of the chandelier going by. This is today the Rococo Theater and is um, considerably more upscale than when it was a movie theater when I was there. I'm going to see Return of the Jedi at this theater. What I really remember about that theater and seeing uh, that movie there was the sound system. <laughs> the sound system, again, had been completely renovated for this theater. Um, you know, they'd put in all kinds of you know, new speakers all over the place, and uh, so you were getting multi-channel sound and all kinds of that. It sounded great. And um, it had been renovated. And one morning, about a week before I was to graduate high school, they were showing um, the jazz singer there. Not, not the one from way back when, but one that had been produced late 1970s or something like that, starring Neil Diamond. And they were letting people go in free so that you could listen to their new cool sound system. Sense around. No, it was not sense around. It was not sense around at all. It was just a very good, high end, banging sound system. Um, so they were having these things free. You could go in anytime you wanted during that morning and watch the film. So here I am in high school. It's like a week before I'm going to graduate. All of our finals are over. You know, everything's done. And they have a senior honors convocation now. I was not getting anything at this honors convocation. I knew a couple of people who were. But for me, it was just going to be yet another boring assembly, right? So I said to myself, self, why do you need to be here? Go downtown and go watch this movie. <laughs> Listen to the new sound system. And so I did. I, I, instead of going to the gymnasium for my, uh, uh, yeah, Larry, Dolby Surround, uh, DTS, uh, absolutely. Everything except sense around. You know, very, very new speakers and a whole new sound system. So I left. I'm walking down the hall in the opposite direction from where the, uh, where, where the gymnasium was, right? And who should I run into on my way through the hall but one of the principals two vice principals, and the governor of the state of Nebraska, who had come to speak at this thing. So this put the principal and vice principal into a bit of a bind. What do you do? Do you stop the student that you know is cutting this thing to reprimand him and tell him to go back where he's supposed to be in front of the governor or not? Well, they chose the better part of valor. They didn't say anything to him. And they gave me nasty looks, but I walked right past all three of them and out the door. Went to this theater and spent a much more enjoyable time uh, watching the, the jazz singers starring Neil Diamond. Not a great movie, but the sound was really good. Now, in terms of listening to it as, you know, when Return of the Jedi was around, um, listening to John Williams' score in that movie theater was pretty freaking awesome. Um, I, I'm sure in that particular case, I know that I saw it from said dead center front row in one case, and I also then later saw it uh, from one of the balconies. Maybe more, I don't remember. Sorry, got five hours to do, and I'm still getting over my uh, sinus infection that I had last week. But what I really remember about that was Jabba the Hutt's voice. Now, you can never recreate the sound that I heard in the Stewart Theater. It's filled with 1,800 people, packed completely full, including the balconies, all three of them. And it had this banging new sound system with great speakers all over the theater, giant ones, small ones, multi-channel tracks, and all kinds of fun like that. Jabba the Hutt's bass in his voice was so bass that it made the theater walls vibrate. It made anything that was structural in that damned theater vibrate. You could feel that bass. Captain just says, what did I think about the Aquaman, Aquaman movie? Uh, let me get through this first Star Wars one and I'll talk about Aquaman. So I appreciate it. I got five hours to fill. I got some content prepared, but I don't know if it'll go five hours. So feel free to break in like you do here. 
So you can't recreate this, you really can't. However, since I am an audio audiophile and a fan die master, I have attempted to do so. So what you're about to hear, I have done by adding a significant amount of bass to Jabba's first line. If you want to really hear this, put on your headset, crank up the volume, and you will sort of hear what I see. Or if you've got some really good speakers, crank the volume, uh, because you will sort of hear what I heard. Message after the message. Oh, so if you're watching in the archives, uh, or now, crank the volume, listen to that extra bass. That is sort of what I heard. Not quite, because you have to remember that bass was vibrating anything. Vibrated the walls, vibrated the vibrated the uh, you know floor of the uh, balconies. It vibrated the seats. I will never forget that one. I'm not thrilled with that movie, but man, uh, that whole first line. I, I've done it ever since. I can't you know replicate it obviously, but that's the one I remember. Bohushuda, you know, just vibrating a whole damn building uh, of which showing again this is the Stewart building where the uh, entire most of the first floor is taken up by the Rococo Ney Stewart Theater. The uh, other thing was that uh, you know it was shaking the whole house you cannot you know do that. Larry Larry says 2001 a space odyssey would sound great yeah um, I would be interested to see it sometime there maybe they'll bring it back as some kind of revival I don't know. You know, so many people have it at home now that I'm not sure they'd do it. But every once in a while, somebody does pull something like that out. Hopefully, crossing my fingers, there's only one theater in town left that I would like to see that at, and that is the Stewart, or now the Rococo Theater. Um, having been uh, largely restored and actually more upscale than when it was, uh, when I knew it as a movie theater, so it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. You'll see, you see the pictures going past there. The other thing that you cannot overlook, I've mentioned this when I talked about Superman, but it's true. What you can't overlook is the audience experience in a place like that. In a place like that, you have 1,800 people, 1,799 other people besides you. And when a movie is put together well, that means all of the audience is feeling all of these things that they're supposed to feel at the same time. When they're cheering, they're cheering. And I mean really cheering. 1,800 people all cheering. You bring the house down. And then they're laughing and they're crying. And they're being frightened. And they're all feeling these emotions all at the same time. And it becomes infectious. The person next to you and the person next to them, it all feeds off of each other and feeds off of each other until you have what has typically been called in theater a shared experience. You are feeding off of each other's emotions such that when things get exciting, you are on the edge of your seat and then you're cheering. When bad things are happening, you're sitting back and you're misting up or crying. Um, it is an infectious, infectious thing that you cannot get today. The only thing I can relate it to is a live rock concert or something like that where you do get that. You, you do get some of that. But about Last Jedi itself, um, was it a great movie? No. It was okay. Um, good way to end that trilogy, um, but not as good as the preceding two movies. Not bad, but not great. If there'd been no more Star Wars movies after that, I'd have been totally fine with it. Yep, some people don't know how to behave in a theater anymore, Larry. Larry, damn skippy about that. Um, you know, as we've had more and more of the home video, people have brought that home video into the theater with them. Now they tend to act in a theater the way that they would sitting at home on a couch. Um, but either way, you know, it's totally different when you got one, 200 people in one of those Cineplex screens versus 1,800 people in three balconies and the box seats all screaming and just having a great time. It's a totally, excuse me, totally different experience. <clears throat> but was Jedi a great movie? No, I didn't think so. That was okay. It wasn't great. It wasn't as good as the preceding two. And since 1980, 39 years, we have not yet had a good Star Wars movie ever since. And I think it's appropriate to assume that we never, ever will. 
I would once again uh, push the Paradise Strong Fire Relief GoFundMe. You can find that at GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, one word, dash fire, dash relief. That's GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, dash fire, dash relief. And your uh, donation is tax deductible. The information to do so is on that page. And 100%, every single penny you spend for that is going to go towards the victims. It's one of the reasons that I chose this charity is because that money, all of it goes straight to the victims and they need help very, very badly. Larry Larry says, Empire Strikes, Strikes Back has been the favorite of a lot of Star Wars fans. Yeah, it, for me, Empire is like one notch just slightly behind uh, Star Wars in terms of that because you know, Star Wars was such a blow-away, mind-blowing experience for me that nothing will ever top that. But Empire comes in a real close second because of what we learned about the Force and you know Luke training and all that and, and how that added to the mythos. We have not since then had in anything that really adds to that mythos particularly. Um, let's see, Aquaman. Uh, real briefly, I'll, I'll go ahead and delve into Aquaman. As I said I at the top, I have some scheduled content, but I'm not married to it. Um, I'm happy to veer off. I've only got another four hours to fill, I guess. So, uh, you know, if we can veer off and we do other things, that's cool with me. Uh, Aquaman. Um, I've seen a screener. I haven't seen it on a big screen, and I may go to see it on a big screen. I think it's better than um, the other movies, with the, pop, with the exception probably of Wonder Woman that DC has released since the Dark Knight movies. Um, you know, they, they, they are being a little bit more like Marvel with respect to um, people in this world. Just, okay, Atlantis is real. We have a guy who is a fish man that is real. Um, so they just kind of take those things as they come. Uh, in terms of it being larger shared universe, one has to ha wonder, you know, I mean, is this, this has got to occur during Clark Kent's lifetime. Um, surely all of those ships and stuff that are being washed up are going to attract his attention. <laughs> this is one of those things that looks like a job for the Justice League, you know. Um, but uh, as a standalone film, I think it's pretty good. You know, the special effects are over the top in some cases, but not hideously so over the top. It was, in general, a movie that, at least on the screener, I enjoyed watching. Um, it did not make me want to walk away like, you know, with, um, The Man of Steel, where I was just like, oh, you guys have fracked it yet again. Um, or Batman v Superman, which is, oh, God, you guys, you're trying to take on uh, Dark Knight Returns uh, from the 1980s, and it doesn't work well here. That is a different kind of story. Wrong. It's not a wrong way to do it. And then Justice League, which just had, you know, so many flaws from being redone and reshot and all of, all of that and the stupid mustache and all of that stuff. So, Larry Larry says, as Jesse Milestone said, they had one shot at having the original cast for Forest Awakens and they blew it. Yes, I'm going to talk about that as I get into the current sequel trilogy. As far as the prequel trilogies, getting back into Star Wars, as far as the prequel trilogies, to me, all three of them fail the basic cinematographer test. As I mentioned before on this show, if you don't know anything else about what a cinematographer did, how they did it, you have to ask yourself two questions. Did you know what you were supposed to see, and could you see what you were supposed to look at? And with the entire prequel trilogy, the answer to that is no. Anytime there's CGI, there is so much crap in the shot that you don't know where to look. And since everything is equally visible, you can't pick out or see anything specific. They are visually confusing messes that sadly set the bar for just about every confusing CGI mess to come afterwards and not just Star Wars. If you really want to know what I think about the uh, about the prequel trilogy, uh, Captain Justice, I want to punch a Last Jedi punching bag. I was pissed after I watched Last Jedi. Uh, I'm going to talk about that. 
<laughs> but if you really want to know what I think about the prequel trilogy, watch the Plinkett reviews. If you have not watched the Plinkett reviews, why not? <laughs> Start right at the beginning. He starts out with Star Trek Generations, goes through all the next gen movies, and then takes on Star Wars. And Star Wars went to a whole new level that created the success of Red Letter Media that they still enjoy today. Um, there's, a, there's a playlist that somebody has out there, has all 51 Plinkett reviews on it. Um, I have a link to that at my website, wrstone.com. Have a look at the side that has the sidebar, and you'll see one for today's show. Just click it, and you'll see all of the many, many links that I have here that I don't dare put in the, uh, the uh, description for fear of getting a community guidelines strike. Uh, Larry Larry says they were showing off CGI way too much. Yeah, yeah. Um, George Lucas in the prequels was very, very self-indulgent and didn't have anybody to tell him no. I mean, who, who is going to tell George, Frack, and Lucas no about Star Wars? Who's actually in the same George, this is, this is invisible. We can't see what's going on here. There's too much CGI. You've shot this whole movie on a, on a green screen. We need to go back and shoot something real for once. <laughs> Even the actors complained about it in a limited way. So, but I have a second here. I neglected to turn this on. Um, if you want to know what I think, if you really want to know what I think, watch the Plinkett reviews because Plinkett says everything that I had been saying or thinking since these damn movies premiered, and he leaves not a damn thing out. Um, I approve of it 100%. If you haven't watched these Plinkett reviews, go. Do it right after this stream because your brain is going to love you for the rest of your life. He comes at it, as I often do, from a theatrical perspective. What visually or plot-wise makes sense, what doesn't, what works, and what doesn't. Larry Larry says the original trilogy started reissuing in 1997, started all the CGI overload. Yeah, yeah, because for some reason... Um, Lucas could not just leave well enough alone. That's why I'm thrilled to have, uh, for the first movie, Star Wars, uh, the original one, the despecialized edition, which is a very, very lovingly handcrafted, uh, redone, recolored, re-everything uh, that brings the film back to what I originally saw. Takes out all the stuff added by special editions, Puts back in what we saw there. The Lucasfilm logo is not that big or ornate thing. It's just Lucasfilm limited production. There is no episode name at the beginning of the opening crawl because there wasn't in that film. Not when I saw it. And all of the stuff that just made it more CGI is gone. And it looks really nice. He's done a really good job of color correcting the whole thing. Shot by shot by shot. If you can get a hold of it, it is a Star Wars, the despecialized edition. He's done the same thing with the rest of the trilogy. Put them back to the original um, condition. Yes, leave great enough alone. Yeah, these films were great. There's no reason to screw with them. There's just none at all. It only ever detracts from what's going on on the screen. Specifically what I think about Attack of the Clones. Well, it sucked. If you want my real opinion, go watch the Plinkett reviews. He says everything I would have said. Enough said. Revenge of the Sith. Well, some people think that's better than the other two. No, no, it wasn't. It sucked. And if you want to know why, go watch the Plinkett Reviews. He said everything that I have ever said ever about this film and done it in a structured way and in a way that you can still enjoy it. Because, like, they're generally 90 minutes to two hours long. So... Ordinarily, you wouldn't be able to be carried through that. I mean, 90 minutes is just somebody talking about a film. Hell, I'd do it enough. <laughs> but, but it wouldn't ordinarily carry you through that. What he has done is he's put in a subplot. Mr. Plinkett is reviewing the review, doing the reviews, but Mr. Plinkett is also something of a psychotic who, among other things, for the prequel trilogy reviews, has a uh, hooker that he keeps in his basement. Um, she, the first movie is about the hooker. Second movie is The Hooker Escapes. 
and the third movie, the hooker comes back for revenge. Um, so he's got that whole subplot going on in the background. It's very funny. And if you uh, watch it, you'll see he, he, uh, Mr. Plinkett is also sort of a psychotic and um, does things and says things that an ordinary person wouldn't. So it's a lot of fun. Go watch the Plinkett reviews. That's all I can say. They will say everything I have ever felt about these movies or saw or believed about them cinemat cinema grab as a cinemat you know, cinematography, that sort of thing. He does it perfectly. I cannot recommend it enough. Go to the Plinkett Reviews. As I say on my website, wrstone.com, on the sidebar, clicking on today's show, he will get you a, a link to a playlist where all of, someone has put together where all of these uh, have been used. So, I push again, the Paradise Strong Fire Relief GoFundMe, which is at gofundme.com slash paradise strong, one word, dash fire dash relief. That's gofundme slash paradise strong dash fire dash relief. And that again is going to have 100% of what you donate, tax deductible, go towards the victims. And they definitely need it. Um, when we get to things like The Force Awakens, my feelings on that in general, and this is, again, just leading back to this notion. It's been 39 years since we've had a really good Star Wars movie. At this point, it is totally illogical for anyone to think that we will ever have a great one again. They, you get to have a new, you know, Force Awakens. It is a beat-for-beat -beat remake of A New Hope. It's just a beat-for-beat -beat remake. There is a lot of stupid plot that asks questions that are never answered. It is yet another J.J. Abrams' big, dumb action movie, or BDAM, as we sometimes talk about it in the Spanish world. J.J. <sighs> Abrams cannot write to save his life. All he can do is direct action. Do not let him in front of a word processor. Do not let any of his buddies in front of a word processor. Hand him a good script written by somebody else, and he'll probably do fine. And as Larry Larry says, getting into that here, that film was their last chance to get the band back together, and they fracked it. We will now never see Luke, Leia, and Han together in one shot, ever. It's over. They lost it. They lost their one opportunity. Speaking directly to Kathleen Kennedy, you have fracked that up big time. Thanks for nothing. You washed up secretary turned producer who is currently getting paid a fortune for completely devaluing a multi-billion dollar franchise. How could you frack this up? It's Star Wars. It's like making mashed potatoes. You pour in the packet. You Pour in the water. Yes, stir. It isn't that complicated, Kathleen. Why? Why do you still have a paycheck? Why? As Larry Larry mentioned, said, Jesse Milestone said, yeah, that is probably the biggest tragedy of the entire prequel of that movie, is that they had an opportunity to get the band back together for one last time, and they blew it. You know, do you not get, Kathleen, that people have strong emotional attachments to these characters, and that's what we actually wanted to see? And if you'd done it, people my age would have walked away thinking, okay, beat for beat remake of A New Hope. But still, it was cool that we got to see them together doing something interesting that was integral to the plot one more time. You blew it. It'll never happen now. Thanks for nothing, Kathleen. As far as The Last Jedi goes, I am in the camp of people who thinks that this was terrible. Uh, as a film, it was a big, confusing, nonsensical mess filled with plot holes and no real character development. And I, of course, really hate, as a Fandai master, I really hate how they fracked up Luke. Frack you, Ryan Johnson. Frack you right in the ear. I won't wish you a hideous, painful death because a fan die master never does that. But frack you. Frack you worse than Lucas and the prequels. Just frack you. 
Captain Jesse says the only reason Kathleen Kennedy still has a paycheck is because the SJW side would totally defend her and the lawsuits, Disney and Bob Iger. Yep. I think you're probably right about that, but listen up, Bob. Listen up. Kathleen Kennedy, and in particular her social justice warrior brand of doing things, is leading towards these guys having what we call get woke, go broke. Nobody wants to hear this crap. And the people who would scream if you fired Kathleen Kennedy the way she deserves to be screamed and fired, screw them. Do you want a multi-billion dollar franchise or not? Get woke, go broke. So, frack you, Kathleen Kennedy. Frack you and your SJW propaganda nonsense. When I say get broke, go get woke, go broke, sadly that's the studio. Kathleen Kennedy isn't going to go broke. She's going to land with a damned golden parachute after blowing Star Wars completely with her woke crap. She will still be a damned multi-millionaire. Frack you, Kathleen Kennedy. Just frack you. Into the more recent stuff that's not part of the mainline Star Wars trilogies, Rogue One. It was an answer to a question that was asked repeatedly in fandom over the years, but it was a question that never needed an answer. <laughs> Cinematically, I found the thing confusing to me. It very much felt like something that had a lot of reshoots that didn't fit all that well together. Um, I just did wasn't a fan of Rogue One. It did... You know, the only part of Rogue One that I really liked, that I actively liked, was the last five minutes with Vader. That part I liked. The rest of it, just confusing. And, and it felt like something that had a lot of reshoots, that was having a lot of issues behind the scenes. And, in fact, it did. Solo, a Star Wars tale. Well, it was an answer to questions that no one ever asked and no one really cared about. It was another film that I found cinematically confusing. It also felt like it's something that had a lot of reshoots. And while I have a lot of respect for Ron Howard, and I do, I have been watching this guy direct since the first time he did anything. His first gig was directing for Roger Corman. <laughs> you know, uh, B-movie schlock master Roger Corman. And so I've been watching him direct since forever, and I've got a lot of respect for him. But... Um, it still felt something like something that had a lot of reshoots, which it did. We know they reshot a huge chunk of the movie, and it didn't necessarily fill, fit along together. Uh, Captain Justice says at least Rogue One felt more like a Starfleet show uh, when Star Wars uh, worked well enough for me. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people. Rogue One, I mean, if you were going to ask me which, what is my favorite of the crap that's been put out since Kathleen Kennedy has had her tenure, I would say probably Rogue One, but I still don't like it. <laughs> it's it's better than some of the other ones. It was there was at least more real things shot in it. I guess you can say that for it. But again, to me, it seemed cinematically confusing. It seemed like something that had a lot of reshoots, and you, know, you can even see it in some shots. Uh, and the trailer, you can see shots that they never used. Um, so. You know, to me, it was just confusing. Just confusing. But Solo's real problem is that by the time that we got into Solo, Kathleen Kennedy and her franchise-killing wokeness had clearly infected the Star Wars movies. After Last of the Jedi, very few people actually care about Star Wars anymore. I got to that point. After Last of the Jedi, I don't care anymore. I just don't care. I have no enthusiasm about it. Uh, they got a movie coming out in a while. Will I go see it? I suppose, but that's because I review movies. But am I excited about it? No. No, I'm not. I'm not excited about it the way that I usually have gotten excited about Star Wars movies up until The Last Jedi. Because that one was so politically correct and so get woke 
and such a badly made film and so many plot holes and what they did to Luke's character. I just, at that point, after that, I am totally unexcited about Star Wars. You know, it's like the Marvel movies, right? I mean, I'm really looking forward to uh, um, Infinity, uh, Avengers uh, Endgame. There is something, almost all of the Marvel movies, I am generally excited to see. I am actively curious what it would be like. Star Wars, just don't care anymore. I just don't care. And I think that a lot of people felt the same way. And so they didn't bother going to see Solo. They said, answers to questions that no one ever asked. In any way, the last one sucked so bad. No, I'm not going to go along with this anymore. I really think that's why it didn't work. I know they want to say, oh, it came at the wrong time of the year. There were other movies and all that. No, if, if people hadn't been just by that time so put off by the whole thing, I think it would have done better business. They are going to be, frankly, damned lucky if Episode Nine makes any money. I mean, will I go to see it? Yeah, probably once. Um, you know, Somehow they managed to pull off fixing it all. I might go more than that, but mostly once, and that's because I review the things. Um, otherwise, would I go see it in a the theater the way I always have? No, I'd probably look for a screener. Probably look for a screener and leave it at that because I just don't see how they're going to pull it out. So I want to speak to Bob Iger. Okay, Bob, do you get this from what I'm talking about? Kathleen Kennedy has destroyed a multi-billion dollar property that any fracking fan on the street, even god-awful fanfic writers, could have done better with. Why does this woman still have a paycheck, Bob? Why she needs to go? Ah, uh, yeah, Captain Justice, I avoided Han Solo because of the weak writing and the social justice uh, warrior political bullcrap. I didn't see the SJW so much in that. Well, okay, there were parts, you know, making Lando Calrissian somebody who screws robots. The generally giant plot hole of droid rights. <laughs> Come on, man, seriously? That you're going to tell me the droids are that intelligent that they have so much. I mean, they've been using droids since forever. You would have thought this was going to be a problem. It would have been a problem a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I, I am not, wasn't particularly thrilled with the writing. I thought it had some exciting sequences, but it was spoiled by plot holes. It was spoiled by, I don't know. It just wasn't that great a movie for me. It wasn't that great a movie for me. So, once again, I'd like to push the Paradise Strong Fire Relief GoFundMe, which you can find at GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong dash Fire dash Relief. That's GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, one word, dash Fire dash Relief. And remember, 100% of what you donate is tax deductible, and it will go, all of it, directly towards victims of the campfire in Paradise, California. The best part of Solo, uh, Captain just says, is the Falcon action. Yeah, I tend to think that's probably true. Yeah, probably true. Uh, it's one of those plot hole things too, right? This is supposed to be, I don't know how many years before um, Star Wars Episode Four, But man, did, um, did Han manage to completely run that ship down in terms of its look and how it looks and all that in whatever period of time we're talking about there. You know, started out totally pristine in this film, and then it's like total crap by the time we get to episode four. Hey, Larry, Larry, thank you very much for uh, donating to that fire relief fund. Um, as I say, every penny you spend will be used to the victims themselves. So, and if it's a significant one, please feel free to grab the um, tax information they've got, claim it as a tax uh, deductible. That for me is the state of Star Wars. There has not been a really good movie since The Empire Strikes Back in 1980. It is now 39 years later. It is completely irrational, given 39 years worth of history, 
to believe that there will ever be a really good Star Wars movie ever again. If there had been something in there that came up and rose to the level of Return of the Jedi or even the first one, then you might be able to have some hope, but there never has been. It has all just been varying degrees of crap. And the best thing you can say about the sequel trilogy is it kind of is better than the prequel one from a filmmaking standpoint. That's really all about you can say about it. Pardon me, still getting over a sinus infection here. Uh, Star Wars wasn't called Episode Vord until 1980. That's exactly right, until uh, Empire Strikes Back was released. We did not have an Episode Four um, or a name at the beginning of that. It was just the opening crawl. That's why I'm so thrilled to have a copy of Star Wars uh, the Despecialized Edition because that returns it back to the original, play, original release, including no title at the beginning. just starts with the crawl. So one of the reasons I love that, that, uh, that fan edit, if you can find it, get it. Um, Star Wars, the Despecialized Edition. And again, they've done it for all three of the original uh, trilogy. So, for example, at the end of uh, Return of the Jedi, when we see Anakin, it's not Hayden Christensen. <laughs> Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. <laughs>